So um, as Perminda was saying, my name is Erin John. Um, I've been with Valley since my graduating residency. Oh gosh, we're going back seven years now and I've been in Fairlawn um, for all that time. Um, I've been married to my husband for 12 years. We have five children. They're almost ranging from 10 to 10 months. So I'm a busy mama as well. Um, but um, I love education. I think ed educating the community, educating the people around you, my patients, um, it's, um, it's a big deal when it comes to treatment plan. Um, and the more information you know, sometimes it's for the better, but I think some information is always needed. Um, and this is a topic that I've been given today, vaccines you need. So you've probably already heard of um, the latest vaccine that's been coming out in the community. Um, there's been a lot of, um, you know, commercials about it. And um, I don't know, maybe you've heard from your own doctor. Um, I'm going to give you some basic insight um, and basic understanding on what the vaccines, how they work, um, what are the current recommendations for adults, okay? So as we age, why do we need vaccines? As we age, our immune systems do not respond as well, right? Our immunity level goes down. And vaccines are one of the best ways to protect yourselves and your loved ones from, pre pre from preventable diseases. So it all not only protects against the disease itself, but also other complications that can happen from, uh, from, from a disease itself. Now, certain vaccines are not given to prevent a disease completely. Most of the vaccines are designed so that it, does, it decreases the severity of the disease that we're talking about. One recent vaccine that came out, it has even better effects, and I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, the most important vaccines that we're going to talk about today, are, of course, COVID-19 vaccine, influenza. Um, the latest one on the market that a lot of you probably have questions about is about the RSV, the pneumococcal vaccine, the shingles vaccine, um, and the tetanus um, whooping cough booster Tdap. And why we talk about routine vaccinations is because as we get older, even though we might have had vaccinations as a kid, our immunity level wanes over time, okay? All right, this is a simple picture I found from the CDC website. Um, if you look at the top of that little blob there, a weakened form of disease germ is injected into the body. The body makes antibodies to fight these invaders. And then if the actual disease does show up in your system, your body is able to recognize the antibodies and then thereby destroy them. And this is the most simplest form of explanation on what it means. Now, if you go a little bit deeper, and this is from the um, World Health Organization. So the first one, um, think the purple one was an existing pathogen. So you've already been vaccinated. That's your measles, right? And it, it, it attacks to your body. You're given the injection. It makes the antibody. And when it presents to your body, you're able to recognize it. Another one is the flu, the chicken pox. Now here comes a new pathogen. Let's go back to 2020 when COVID-19 came up, right? It was a new pathogen to our system. Our body did not recognize it. We didn't know what it was. And so there was a need for a newer vaccine to be developed. So now there are three main, again, this is all from the WHO website. There are three main approaches to making a vaccine. I'm not going into details, but I'm gonna give you some overview. One of them is using a whole virus, the first one. The second one, it looks at parts of the trigger system of the, uh, of the virus itself for your body. And the other one, it's looking at the genetic material, your DNA of the RNA of the actual virus, okay? Um, the first one, the whole virus, we'll go into a little bit more. There's the inactivated one, meaning it is there, but it's not active in your system live attenuated vaccine, vaccine and a viral vector. All these pretty much means that even though the microbe is as a whole, it's not harmful to your body. There are ways that they can, thank God for technology, right? Way, ways that they can manipulate that particular virus, change it into the way that it is safer for your body, yet enough that your body is able to recognize it. So when your true pathogen comes to attack your body, your baby has your your body has memory cells to reco recollect. Oh yes, I've been vaccinated. I have antibodies. I can go attack it. And there's several ways that the body does that. Now the the other one we talked about. See, there's um, the three main. Now we're talking about the second one. Okay. It uses a specific part, a subunit of that virus, 
that your body needs to trigger an immune response to. And then finally, the DNA material or the RNA material, which is what the latest COVID-19 vaccines were based off the RNA. Now, what does it, what does the vaccine do? Remember, you see that, I wish I had a pointer. Maybe I do, and I just don't know where it is. Oh, yeah. Do I hit, do I hit the red dot? Okay, yeah. So a vaccine is a tiny, weakened, non-dangerous fragment of, sorry, it's there, non-dangerous fragment of the, of, of the organism itself, but there's enough material in it for your body to recognize. And then the body makes the antibody, the new antibody that can attach. So when a true pathogen like COVID-19 gets into your system, your body is able to recognize this, attach your current antibody that you made to it, and thereby create an immune response to your body, okay? And so it's not like a new material your body is seeing for the first time. So that it's like, oh, yes, I've seen this before. I know how to deal with it. I know to release certain things in your body that can help decrease the intensity of the immune response that can happen, all right? So that's the job of the vaccine, to make something that your body can recognize. Oh, I guess I pressed the wrong one. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll go back. Okay, so why do we talk about this so much? Why is vaccines so important? Um, a lot of it is because the burden of the disease and what it could do to adults. So let's just talk about the first one, influenza. And this is data from a few years out, probably um, early, I think it was from 2004, yeah. What happened, uh, data from then, millions of cases, an average of 226,000 hospitalizations um, about 75% were from the adults. And the death rate was anywhere between 3,000 to 49,000. About 90% among them were adults. Now, the next one where we talk about the pneumococcal one, which is the Prevnar, I don't know if you remember, Pneumovax, if you remember. So pneumococcal, one of the bacteria that it's, or the bacteria that it looks at is called streptococcal pneumoniae. And what it does throughout the years, and this is the one just from 2010 alone, about 40,000 total cases and about 4,000 4, total deaths from pneumonia alone in 2010. Um, worldwide, 300,000 in children uh, from that pneumonia case. Um, and worldwide, pneumonia, the strep pneumonia was the leading cause of mortality from pneumonia alone. So a lot of cases, a lot of people dying from a younger age hence need for vaccines. So you probably all remember when the polio um, epidemic was going, maybe, um, and the need for the vaccine for the polio to be developed. And thankfully, it, ha it has been eradicated for majority of the world. There's certain parts still in, um, I believe when I was reading Pakistan and Afghanistan, where it's not totally eradicated even now. Uh, for the whole country, and the whole world, in fact, to eradicate polio in Africa was a big deal. And I think that was accomplished just recently in the last, I don't know, within the last five years uh, from, from the reading that I was reading the other day. Now, shingles, that's another common vaccine that we've talked about, about 1 million cases of shingles in the U.S. about annually. Hepatitis B is another vaccine. Pertussis, whooping cough. We had stopped talking about it more even more push to get the adults vaccinated for that as well. And really the direct medical cost, and this is going back ooh, uh, 2007, 2013, 14, um, 10.4 billion. I trust you since COVID, it's been a lot more. Um, add and loss of work and life, 87 billion. That's bare minimum at this point. Vaccination prevented 7 million in illnesses, 3 million medically attended illnesses and 90,000 plus vaccinations. Now, the impact of vaccines. Now, a lot of patients say, oh, I got the flu shot, I still ended up with the flu. I got the pneumonia shot, I still ended up with the pneumonia. I got the shingles shot, I still ended up with, with shingles itself. The idea of those vaccines are not to completely prevent. The idea of the endpoint result, meaning when they were doing the studies to try to figure out if this vaccine is helpful or not, those were given with the endpoint goal that A, you won't end up in the hospital because of it, B, you won't end up with, with anything from a life-sustaining, meaning like requiring oxygen to breathe, et cetera. From our own, so from shingles in particularly, 
not given that you'll never catch shingles, but the severity of the disease is much less. I don't know if you've heard about the pain from shingles. It's called herpetic neuralgia. The idea of the vaccine is to decrease the intensity of that, never to say that you'll never catch it. In my own population, so I've had several patients with shingle shot get shingles, without shingle shot get shingles. Their discrepancy happens with the severity. Severity for shingles, the pain, the herpetic neuralgia, can last anywhere from days to years. And the shot is given to decrease the intensity of that. Pneumococcal, 45% helps to you know, avoid in itself, but really it's given to avoid the severity of the disease. Ending up in the hospital, needing something to help you breathe, making it more of a longer term illness, okay? Influenza, same thing, hepatitis B. So, all right, I'll skip this. Oh, a quick point on um, just pregnant women in total, um, and I don't know who's listening from home, so I just wanted to say, pregnant women should not receive any of the live vaccines, and currently the live vaccines are MMR and varicella, okay? Pregnant women should receive the tetanus diphtheria pertussis booster, Tdap, in the third trimester, usually either your OB or your you know, family med doc or your general practitioner will talk to you. And that's because babies, when they're born, pertussis, which is whooping cough, very dangerous. Um, babies, when they're born, they're too young to receive, um, infants are too young to receive the pertussis um, shot. And so that could be, um, you know, deathly for patients, it's fatal. So we try to vaccine, vaccinate the immediate family, those that are taking care of the baby. Suppose it's a grandparent that's taking care of the parent, parent baby, mom, dad, etc. So it's kind of like the initial unit. Um, I probably won't be talking. Yeah, I guess I will talk about it a little bit more later. Um, and Tdap is one of those vaccines that's been in the market for so long. Um, when we first came up or when COVID vaccine was first released, everybody was so worried um, about vaccinating our pregnant mothers. Um, and I will tell you off the bat, I was a COVID mom. Um, I had my first baby during the first wave uh, in May 2020. So that was when vaccines weren't introduced, of course. And that's when, you know, your husband may or may not show up in your <laughs> uh, hospital room. Um, and since then, I've had another baby, 10 months old now. Um, and I'm happy to say that I took my vaccine while I was pregnant. Um, only because I, my husband is a pharmacist, so him and I read through every single document we could possibly find to look at interactions and what it would do. So Tdap is a vaccine given to mothers. Why are they given to mothers? Because you want to, you want the vaccine and the antibodies to cross the placenta barrier. You are giving it to your baby, wholly understanding that your purpose to do that is to protect your baby. So when COVID-19 vaccines were introduced, the whole idea of it could it cross the placental barrier? Yes, the idea was that it would, so that the baby would have some immunity. Because remember back then, they, they, it was just recently that the vaccines for the infants were introduced. So whatever you could do to protect your infant, um, as a mom, um, of course, um, and as a medical professional, professional um, um, you know, we did what we could. And thankfully, we have healthy baby now. <laughs> Um, influenza vaccine is another vaccine for pregnant women. Um, I've, again, all my pregnancies, I've taken it. I strongly recommend it for my patients as well. Pregnant women, non-pregnant women, um, kids all in age. So this is the United States cause of death, causes of death in 2019. And I share this with a particular reason, and you'll see why in the next slide. Um, most of the, the world is different because there's a lot of other illnesses around there, but in the United States, the most common, the most reason um, the, or the highest reason for death um, in 2019 was heart disease. The second one after that was cancer. The third one after that is accidents, injuries, and the list goes down. Who can predict 2020? COVID, COVID yeah, right? Okay, so let's go 2020. In 2020, this is from the CDC website, by the way. The number one was heart disease, number two, cancer, number three, COVID. So the, the, the need for the vaccine, the need to help our 
population um, was in the forefront of everybody's mind. And through the years, everyone, it, it's been documented for years of you know um, data that vaccine prevents diseases, vaccine can um, decrease the intensity of a disease, progression of a patient's illness. Um, and there, that, that's when the whole push to get the vaccine came about, because even if you could treat it, it wouldn't be enough to treat the mass. And we're talking about the whole world, not just the United States. So COVID-19, respiratory disease, right? It's, we've been among it, living it for the past, you know, three and a half years at this point. Um, oh, actually, yeah, three and a half years in the, in the US. March, I'll never forget it, March 11th, we shut down. March 12th was my kids, my second daughter's birthday, and we had a birthday party planned. <laughs> um, and everything had to be roll, rolled over. In 2020, um, adults age 65 and older made up 81% of the total deaths due to COVID-19 in the US, a, a, a staggering number. COVID-19 vaccines are highly recommended for all individuals to protect from serious illness and death. And as, and this is the current one I wanted to talk about, as of September 14th, 2023, the latest vaccines, FDA approval CDC recommendation applies only to one, um, or just two of the, uh, of the shot. Pfizer um, has the, the latest one and Moderna. They're going away from the name of booster. Um, it might turn into what we call an annual shot. So they're going to, they're trying to get away from that term booster shot. Um, and the the latest, the pr one prior to this was called bivalent. Um, I don't know if any one of y'all took the bivalent vaccine. It was called bi because it had two strains. The current one that's just about to start, it's monovalent, uh, meaning just one strain. Um, it's, the, it's the one that's currently for an Omicron subvariant. Um, if you wanted the fancy name, XBB.1.5. Um, and that's the one that you should, that I would, and anyone would recommend. In fact, they're taking the bivalent, I think they already did, off the market. It's no longer available, the bivalent COVID booster. Um, and right now, the one that's available, who do I recommend it to? Um, certainly my 65 and older. Um, I'm, I'm, I've pushed it even as far as um, uh, if you're if you're considered an immunocompromised, but hands down, certainly my 65 and older. Um, it, and it's the, the, these are questions I, I anticipated from a lot of you, so I'm just going to ask you, if, or I'm just going to uh, mention, if I had COVID recently, when should I get the updated vaccine? I've been saying it throughout, and even the CDC agrees, at least three months out, you could wait. Um, if I recently received the bivalent vaccine, a lot of people traveled over the summer, so they took a vaccine before they traveled. And the, the part, now the new one is coming out in fall. Should I take it? CDC says you could wait at least two months before you take it. Okay. You could wait three months after you have COVID, two months if you got the bivalent booster in the last few months or so. Yeah, so the, the bivalent one, the one that covered two, that was kind of given everywhere during the summer, is probably off the market now. There was a big drive to stop it. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, and the, if they are offering it, make sure you get the new, the latest one. Yeah. If they will, if they will say, if the new, uh, if I'm just repeating it so the people at home can understand, um, the question was if the CVS or the pharmacy would tell you if they're giving you the latest one. I would assume they would. I would always err on the side of caution and ask yourself. Hmm. Updated COVID boost, uh, updated COVID vaccine. I think that's what they're calling it. It's, they're going away with the term booster. <laughs> updated COVID vaccine. You don't need to say that. They, they probably won't, yeah. Uh, but it's definitely, in the sense that it's not the bivalent. Everybody had the word COVID booster, bivalent vaccine, yep. And that's gone away now. And now it's a single valent, monovalent. But you just have to say the updated COVID vaccine. 
Yes. Okay, so I mentioned it by the year 2023 to 2024. And if you had the shot over the summer, it's okay to wait at least the two months and then get the latest booster. Okay, so we'll, we and I'll, I'm opening up to questions in the end as well. Okay, no problem. Um, now the next one I want to go over was the flu shot, of, of course. Flu, as you know, has been around for a long, long time. Uh, flu has been one of our, I guess I should say, our serial killers, right? Um, 70, 70 to 85 percent of flu-related rela deaths occur among the adults 65 and older. The risk of heart attack in older adults is increases by three to five times within the first two weeks of a flu infection. The risk of a stroke in older adults is increased by two to three times within the first two weeks of an infection. Having flu then thereby increases the risk for you to catch pneumonia. So the best way to protect ourselves, again, with vaccine. Timing of it, I usually, uh, or CDC, me, everyone, usually recommend between October, um, to end of September, October, that's the best month to get it. Um, and it's approved for over the age of six months. Um, and with, they say, why is it a new booster? Uh, everybody gets flu shot every year. Why is that, right? Flu strains change rapidly. The virus itself changes rapidly. So we look at what happens in the Southern hemisphere, usually Australia, and there's a big team of epidemiologists, scientists, doctors that convene to decide what the newer vaccine would look like. So they, lo they look at what happens in the earlier season because their winters are earlier than us, right? Because of the Southern hemisphere. And then they decide. So CDC reported that the US in 2023-24 flu vaccines have a similar vaccine virus composition as the 2023 Southern Hemisphere flu strains. So they look at what were the flu strains going around um, in the Southern Hemisphere and then they make it um, so that it's similar for what we might also anticipate during our winter season. So now the latest one, <laughs> RSV vaccine. Um, there's two two brands I think that just came out. One's by Pfizer, one is by GSK, GlaxoSmith, um, Arexvi, Abrizvo, if you, you've probably heard it over, um, I don't know, I haven't seen many commercials yet, but I know some of the pharmacies uh, have started to hold it. Currently for 60 years and older. Um, this is a virus that's been known for a very long time Usually my younger population, my pediatric population, and my older adults are the ones that uh, end up with the severity of the disease. It has not been approved for the pediatric population yet. Um, it's certainly not approved for less than 60 at this point. Um, and if you, the most common side effects that I've seen in the market, and I spoke to um, representatives for it was arm soreness, um, you know, injection site reactions, maybe a little achy, pretty much similar to um, like a flu pneumonia type of thing. Um, and it's, again, increases the risk for um, increases the risk for mortality for my older patients, increases the risk for the severity of the disease for my older patients. We're very happy to see it. Is it going to be an annual vaccine? They have not decided that yet. They're still going to see what the vaccine does to the community and do some more research to see what the levels look like for next year. Um, it's a shared decision making. I would urge you to speak to your doctor to see if they would recommend it for you. Yeah. So RSV is very new. It has not been studied with other vaccines together, with COVID, with flu, as, as just any, any person and just common sense, right? I would say don't do it. Because if you're getting a side effect, if you, God forbid, an allergic reaction, you want to know which one gave it to you. So I would space it apart. Um, the... I think that's a fair assessment. Um, they, they didn't say how many weeks to wait. They just said not to take it together. The 
question was, when, if you should take the RSV, the, the latest RSV vaccine with other uh, vaccines, um, and the studies all should, said not to, it has not been studied to do that. Um, and as common sense, I would wait before you take any of the vaccines. Yes. You know, from CDC, they, they said it was okay. They had been studied for a long time at this point. Um, but I always say, why? <laughs> we have time, <laughs> just space it apart. Yeah. It, Yeah, so they, they do that on, uh, um, with with a good intention because the likelihood of a person returning for another shot decreases. And and then that's more of a mass issue as well. Because if one person does it, it's more likely that more people will do it. And then you're risking the fact that they're not getting the next vaccine and increasing the risk of other patients. So they're doing it with the right intention in heart. But if you are you know a reliable person and you have it in order, yeah. It's fine. They've been studied together. Yeah, yeah. I always, I always say that as a error in the side of caution. So, like my pediatrician's office, I'll give you an example. Um, they're always recommending because usually during the summer months, I take my kids for their um, um, annual exams, and they, you know, they're always pushing to get the flu shot right, right during the summer months. And I always thought, like, why? Why are it's too early? I would wait till October. So I had like a DJ. Yeah, and you won't believe, you know, things, once school starts, it gets so busy, chance of a parent bringing the kid back just decreases in so many reasons. So better to get it in them rather than not at all. Um, so it's more of a, because you're looking at a mass, you're not looking at one person. If one person's doing it, it's more likely that more people are going to do it. Shingles vaccine, um, one out of three people will develop shingles in their lifetime. That's the current, um, you know, a risk analysis. Um, shingles, most of us have had chicken pox as, an adult, uh, as, as a kid. The virus lives in one of the nerve roots in the spine. As we get older in immunocompromised state, you get sick, the, the thing reacts and shows up its true self. It shows up as a rash. Um, if, you, if you get time to look at it, it's called a dermatome map of the body. And it shows you which nerve roots are part of the body. And in, if it's in the arm, you'll see it in a, a vertical way. Like you'll see it going down. If it's your, sorry, if it's your torso, it'll be linear. If it's your leg, it'll be also going, oh, I shouldn't say linear. It'll be horizontal. If it's your, your lower extremity, it'll go down. Um, and the rash, painful as can be, the shingles vaccine, decreases the intensity of that. It's found to be 90, 97% effective at preventing shingles, 91 effective for the older adults 70 and over, but really the talking point given so that it doesn't increase the severity of the disease. It's currently approved for 50 and older. Um, um, some insurances pay only 60 and older, so just double check with the insurance survey. I've seen that happen too. There are two doses given two to six months apart. I always preface this vaccine with my patients. It is a doozy. <laughs> you will have side effects or may not, but most likely you will have side effects. I usually tell my patients, take this on a Friday. Expect to have an easy weekend. Um, you know, don't have a wedding planned because <laughs> uh, it won't be fun. <laughs> um, and wait two to six months to get the second shot. The, the previous shingles vaccine was the live vaccine. This is not live. Questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes, in medicine, everything, yeah, right? Is it a one-time deal now? Today, yes, it is a one-time deal. 10 years from now, I don't know, we'll see. Um, but they're actively working to make sure, so like the most recent uh, vaccine for shingles, I think the last time I gave it to patients, the older vaccine was probably 2017, 2015. Um, and then the newer one came out. They were hoping that previous one would be effective for you know, till into your 80s and 90s, and studies showed that it just drastically waned over time. So that's why the newer the newer shot had to be developed. So it's after, yeah. No, sorry, the old one, sorry, the old one is called Zoster. 
ma'am, the old one, yeah, the, now it's, yes, Shingrix. Shingrix? Zostavax was the old one. Yes. Yes, you can't, even though you're waiting the two to six months apart, you can definitely take other vaccines during that time. That's not a problem. Um, and if someone say, oh, I missed the, the six month dose, I forgot about it. Should I have to restart the series? No, you don't have to restart the series. It's get it in you, you know, as early as you can. Yes, was there another question? No, okay. So the next one we're gonna talk about is the pneumococcal vaccine. A lot, it's definitely recommended for my 65 and older population. Now there's a little bit of change in this one as well in the last ooh, year, year and a half. Um, if you're at 65, you probably received Prevnar 13. And at 66, we usually give the Pneumovax 23. And the last one to two years, the newer one came out, Prevnar 20, and that's the one that we are giving now. So at 60, anyone turning 65 now, we no longer do the 13 and then the 23, we do 20 and that's it. If you've had the 16, do you need to get, or if you've had the two shot series, do you need to get it again? No. Uh, for our younger population, 65 and 64 and below, immunocompromised situation, the doctor will recommend depending on where they are. Um, what else? So yes, yeah, so for those who never received any pneumococcal vaccine, um, usually people give the Prevnar 20 now, there is Prevnar 15 available. 65 and older, we'll get that one shot for now, 16 to 64, like I said, any medical conditions that puts them at an increased risk. The, uh, we talked a little bit of this one before, the Tdap vaccine. Um, and I'll tell you a, a story, um, not a story, <laughs> real life experience. <laughs> um, when I was um, when I was right around about to deliver my my third baby, um, I was exposed to whooping cough in, at, at work. One of our patients tested positive for, for protectors. So I went, you know, it was time for, I didn't know, um, had the baby. I called my manager, so excited, and she was in time, so excited for me. <laughs> and I was like, mm, what happened? She goes, I'm sorry to tell you, but you were exposed to pertussis during the last week that I was there for maternity work. Um, so then, you know, oh, everything falls down on you. The weight of the world is on your shoulders now because I got exposed to pertussis. I know very well. I did have the TDAP vaccine, but I still know very well that um, it's dangerous for my baby. Um, had to make a decision with my pediatrician, with the guy, uh, with my OB, um, and I had to be medicated for the first week of uh, my baby being born. Um, and of course, being my husband, being a pharmacist, <laughs> there's a lot of side effects when you're on that medication for babies, when, even if even if it's um, given through the baby through the milk. Um, so there's always risks involved. There has been a heightened number of cases of whooping cough in the community. That's why there's been a lot, lot more push for the Tdap vaccine to be vaccinated. Um, if you if you are getting the vaccine, you keep it for ten years because it's also your t, uh, your TD coverage as well. You know the one if you get stuck by a, a dirty nail, a rusty nail, a dirty wound. That's usually given every ten years. Um, if you are an immediate family member to a baby, um, you know, your hands-on in care, daily interactions with the infant, I would strongly urge to make sure that you, yours is up to date. Um, and whooping cough, um, you know, it, it, it causes uncontrollable violent coughing, making it difficult to breathe, um, decreases the intensity, very effective in um, keeping the disease down. Most of us, if we've had the vaccine, you probably don't even realize that you had the pertussis at that point. But it's the ones that didn't have the immunity level up. Um, those coughs can be quite, quite violent, to say the least. And these are the, yes, go ahead, yes. You had a question, yes. Yes, yes. So that, 
that's from the, uh, yeah, you can get it either from, mostly people get it from the pharmacies. Now, um, uh, insurances are very, very tricky. Medicare has certain rules about Tdap, and my my latest understanding was like they were trying to change the coverage for it. So I would first call your insurance company to see what the cost for the Tdap is. I would hate for you to get it and then get stuck with the giant bill, and that's not any of our intention. Um, but Medicare, when it comes to Tdap, I, I wouldn't say because they, there was there is a talk going on to change the coverage plan. So best to call your insurance company first to see what the coverage looks like. But if you haven't had the vaccine in the last 10 years, yes, it's recommended for you. Yes. So that's what the Medicare issue was. If it were giving it a doctor's office, certain, certain vaccines were not covered, but there is a talk that that's changing. Tdap was one of those vaccines that Medicare had said that they would not cover at all unless you got a dirty wound, then we will give it to you. But that also, the, the, my last understanding was at the talk, I don't, I don't know if it's approved yet, I don't know if you know anything about it from that standpoint, but there was a talk that they were not approving. So I, that's why for TDAP, I would say, yes, exactly. Um, but there was a big push to change that talk and I, I'm, I'm not sure of what the end rule was. Yes. No, so it's not. So Tdap comes in different forms, or tetanus booster comes in different forms. It comes in Td alone, yes, and Tdap. Most of the places are just using Tdap now because you were, were pushing for the pertussis booster as well, but you would have to verify that. Um, so this is just the current recommendation schedule. Um, but that's available online. <laughs> so I just pulled it up for 65 and above. Um, and I wanted to, oh, we did the new share. Oops, we did the new share, right? And then I went to the adult data and I double clicked. All right, so this is the January, 2023, New Jersey update. Um, I, you know, since we're talking, I wanted to give us like a little idea of where we are in New Jersey, right? So this is for, from 2016 to 2021, right here. Blue shots, um, green is the United States. We're pretty, we're, we're, we're better, close to 80% um, for the flu shot from 2020 up to 2022. For pneumococcal, we're pretty low from the 65 and below. We want this target to be higher than the 70%. Um, this is for Tdap, this is uh, for Tdap in 2021, 2020. This is um, Tdap for the younger age group, and this is the Zoster booster that was available then. I wanted to go down and show you influenza now. Our target is quite good in New Jersey. Um, this is the healthy people target that they say is 70 percent as like the goal. Um, our 65 and above community in New Jersey were pretty good, so close to 80 percent. And this was from. 2021, 2022, so last year's record, okay? And quickly for pneumococcal, um, the United States standard, we're slightly below um, for New Jersey, for both of them, in fact. So that's something um, I would recommend to look into the pneumococcal vaccine target. Um, this is the tetanus booster, as we said, and then this is the shingles vaccine. My 65 and older, we are quite good. Um, it's recommended for a 50 and above, um, the shingles, the shingrix vaccine that's currently available. And this data is quite uh, from 2021, the blue one right here. So if you look on this side, you'll see the target level is still low. Um, it's still around 40%. They're saying the healthy target objective for the US is 30%, but we could do better. <laughs> and that's for the maternal section for COVID-19. Oh, this is the COVID-19 for 2021. Um, my 65 and older, man, we are quite good. Um, this is the green one is to say if you've completed the series. Um, the red one is to say if you've completed the primary two-shot series. 
and the blue is for one. So if we can get more patients completed in the booster series, or I guess the newer vaccine, to keep up our immunity level would be helpful. Um, yes, pretty much that. Well, thank you. Questions? Yes. Yeah, so um, typically those are not like routine vaccinations to be given for boosters, but there are certain populations that it would approve for. So there was a outbreak, um, as you might have seen, I think there was a few years ago in um, Disney area um, that they had the uh, outbreak. And it's just to make sure that there's a population of people that didn't receive the initial two. And they, they're, whether they're vaccine you know, rejectors or whatever the case might be. The boosters, in some cases where people are traveling, there's a one-shot booster that we would do. If you're in a community where it's at a higher risk because a lot more patients are testing positive, then for that community, we would do. But not for a general population. It's not a booster recommendation. Yes. Um, I just... Um, Um, if you had shingles, do you get the shingles vaccine? Do you need a prescription for us? You, do, you really never need prescriptions for um, it. You usually the pharmacy is able to. Um, if you're going to an independent pharmacy, like a smaller pharmacy, they might need a prescription from the doctor, but usually the bigger companies, they don't. Um, if you've had shingles, do you need to get the booster? Yes, you do. You still need to get the booster or still recommend it for you because you can still catch it at a later point again. So you want to decrease the level of um, disease um, severity. Yes, next question, yeah. Anyway, so should you take the shingles vaccine if you know for a fact that you've never had chicken pox or if you titers have been negative that you've never had it? So like, yeah, it's a talking point to say, some, some doctors will say, think of it as a whole community. Um, it's you cannot go check for a whole community to see if that person still has an immunity or was it truly a lot of patients when they got chicken pox as a kid they might have not realized that they, that they caught the, the chicken pox maybe the case was very or, or the case at that point was quite uh, less severe but as you get older the way the shingle or shingles presents itself it becomes harder but if you have documented fact that you've never had shingles can you still catch? I guess the, the chances of it is still at that point is still very low. But if you if you get exposed to chicken pox at a later point and you're not vigilant about it, and if you're traveling, then it becomes even more tricky. Yes, next question. So um Shingles, the current Shingrix vaccine is not a live vaccine. Um, the previous one was, um, but the current one is not a live vaccine. Yeah, so uh, is there any heart ailments for patients who've had COVID vaccine? So when the study was released, myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, um, you know, was strongly, um, you know, studied upon, reviewed upon, detailed study on it, even after the vaccination aspect, still ongoing. Um, in my own personal population, no, thankfully, none of my patients did. Um, but yeah, the studies have shown that there are cases of uh, COVID-19 or vaccine induced, but also there are even worse side effects that happen from COVID itself. Um, so there's, a discussion of what you, you know your risk factor um uh, discussion of what you can do to protect your body your people around you your family um but yes there are several documented cases absolutely yes So if you've got all the vaccines, um, 
but you recently got COVID itself, are there any long-term effects for that? COVID, man, that, the disease itself is so interesting as of what it has done to a human population and each body. I've had patients during the crux of it that had COVID and ended up with a raging rheumatoid arthritis for the first time a few weeks later. And my talking point to that patient was, you were probably predisposed and this just pushed you over the edge to get it sooner, if you wanted to say. So what are your long-term risks? It's an individual question. It's hard for me to assess to say what your individual long-term risk is. There's risk with everything, right? But my guess is maybe you had a milder case, thankfully, I hope. <laughs> um, and then to see, to just to be on top of it, to see if you're noticing changes in the few weeks ahead. But is the long-term risk, is there a risk reduction for long-term risks if you've been COVID vaccinated? Yes, that's what all the studies show. Yes. If you've received the two shot series, then that's it. The, I mean, okay, sorry, I didn't say the question. Um, if you've had the pneumonia shots, so it just changed in the last like year or two. So you have to go back to your doctor to see which pneumonia shot you got in the past. If you've had the 65 and above, if you've had the Prevnar 13 and the Pneumovax 23, then the current re recommendation is you don't need to get the latest one. But if you didn't complete your series or you are medic, uh, vaccine naive, then you'll need to get the newer one. Yes, one more, yeah, more, yes. <laughs> yes, so is there a reason why they no longer offer the bivalent shot? Yes, so they are monitored very regularly. So when you're swabbing and it's sent to, um, the you know like a, a lab it, it, it's like monitored throughout the country to see what the strain is and the strain that was prevalent during the time of the bivalent has gone down and now it's a different strain and so the new vaccine is for the rising strain that's going on that is more vaccine evading so they wanted to give a newer uh, a newer strain vaccine Good. So it's a lot. <laughs> um, and I do urge you to have your own individual conversations with your doctor. Um, it's meant from a heart, take it from a heart of um, to think that you're doing what you can to protect your body, for your family, for your own future. Uh, but it's in every, every shot that you take, every medication that you take is very, very individualized. So make sure you ask the right questions, um, get as much information as you can. All right, nice to meet you all, thank you.